Apostle Paul, dealing with the doctrine of election. Q&A with the Apostle Paul over the doctrine of election. That's what Romans 9 is about, and that's what we'll cover. To get us thinking a little bit, we are curious creatures, and sometimes in our curiosity we find ourselves just too close to the edge. And I want to show you some pictures of people that got a little too close to the edge, okay? So some of you might know this place. This is Glacier Point. Uh, This is in Yosemite. It is a really cool place where you can see Half Dome and you can see El Capitan. It's 3,500 feet above the valley floor. Who has been to Glacier Point? Okay, those who hands are down, um, you're going to get a citizen's arrest at the end of this message. You really got to go. I mean, you got to see this stuff. It's, It's in California. People come from Germany to see this place. Anyway, so... Next slide is uh, Taft Point. So you can actually, you can go out further. You don't have to stay there where those people were. You can actually go out further and kind of get to the edge of the rocks to see this great valley and all these sites. But you can also go too far. And I want to show you this next picture here. Um, This is a couple years ago, but this is uh, an article about Is Our Life just worth a photo, the tragic death of a couple in Yosemite. So this couple was, they're influencers, they take pictures in crazy places, and so um, this picture actually isn't in Yosemite. If you notice, that picture is probably the Grand Canyon, but they found this couple at the bottom of Glacier Point, and they weren't really sure what happened to them, but this next photo I'll show you is interesting This is a couple taking a selfie of themselves out on that point, but you can see in the background that girl in the left, she was, she was up there getting ready to take a picture with her husband and they got too close to the edge. And when you fall there, you don't live like you're, you're going to die. And so we can, we're curious and we like to get to the edge of things, but we can get a little too far. The Apostle Paul, this morning, we're going we're gonna to peer into a dangerous doctrine. It's a doctrine that you can go too far in, and some people do, and there's dangers to that. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, knows that this doctrine will stretch us to our spiritual and mental limits. He knows the dangers of taking this doctrine too far, but it's necessary to give us this doctrine so that we can get the most comprehensive view of God that we can handle, that we can understand. So we need to know about God's wrath, about God's justice, about God's love, about God's mercy, about God's grace, but there's a tension to these, these doctrines. Um, I like what Jonathan Edwards said. He said, we need, he said, thus it is necessary that God's awful majesty, calling, and his dreadful greatness, justice, and holiness should be manifested. And that was, I thought it was really interesting how Jonathan Edwards used the word awful majesty dreadful greatness. I've never heard those words put together like that. So what keeps these attributes, these intention, is the doctrine of election. The doctrine of God's sovereignty and saving lost sinners. And the Bible leaves us in this tension. There's a paradox here, and the, and the tension is this. On, on one hand... Man is responsible for their sin. Man is morally accountable to God. And so there's some scriptures like John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, give you a couple other scriptures. 
to help you see man's responsibility, the heart of God. 1 Timothy 2.4 says who this is referring to God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We have scriptures like 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Um, there's scriptures like in Romans 10, just the next chapter, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, there's scriptures like Matthew 11, Jesus says things like, come to me all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So there's this universal invitation by Christ for all to come. And that idea that, that we're responsible and the idea that kind of struggles with God's sovereignty is this, is this, this idea. I don't even want to say it's a fact because I don't really believe it's true. But they really camp on the free will of man. That we have a free will. And that's a real popular thing to believe, especially in America, where we prize our freedom. But if I read the Bible correctly, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're slaves to sin, and so that freedom is very limited. And, and free is an is a ultimate term. It's either free or it's not. Or you could say man has a free will and God's will is freer. A good hinge verse between one view and the other I want to show you is from 1 Timothy 4. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So Jesus is the Savior of all man, but it's especially, it's, it's given to those who repent and believe on Christ. And so the other side of that, uh, this debate, is God's sovereignty, his control over all who will be saved. And so we have scriptures, I'll just, in a little bit in the Old Testament, you have Ezekiel 16, God chose Israel to be his people. For whatever reason, people don't tend to argue with that very much, that God chose a nation, God chose Israel. So in Ezekiel 16, it's a picture of a child, an infant that was abandoned by its parents in a field and just helpless and squirming in a field. And God comes and graciously and mercifully picks up this infant and brings them to health and clothes them. Deuteronomy 7, 6 is one of the more important passages too in this. Um, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then a couple more as we progress into the New Testament, I want to give you some scriptures that really help you see God's choosing and electing. First, or Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And then 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Typically when one of our elders rat prays, he'll typically end his prayer with, we love because you first loved us. That's right from 1 John 4, 9. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. 2 Timothy 2 talks about God granting repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. I would keep going. Acts 13, 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. 2 Thessalonians 2, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord. So hopefully you can see the tension here that on one side you have man's responsibility that we're 
culpable or responsible to God. On the other side, you see God's sovereignty and his choice and his election. And so we find ourselves in this paradox. A paradox is um, para meaning alongside of. We get parallel lines from it. And then doxa is ideas, opinions, and so thoughts. And so a paradox is, is thoughts or opinions that run alongside each other, but they never touch. And that's what we have. We have this tension. And I'm okay living in this tension because God is God and I am not. But a lot of people really struggle with this, this tension. And uh, I want to help you maybe understand that a little better today. So in Romans 9, Paul's going to take us to the edge, to the precipice of God's sovereignty in electing sinners. And he takes us as far as our, our puny little brains can go. He's going to take us right to the edge, but he's not going to let us fall off. He's going to take us right to the guardrail and the, and the sign, Deuteronomy 29, 29, a really important scripture as we think about difficult scriptures, difficult doctrines. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord and the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So there's things that God just does not reveal to us because he knows we can't, can't handle it. It's beyond our, our ability. So sometimes we have to just stop there. So Romans chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 19 to 24. That's where we'll be this morning. Then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power, make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles." Let me pray for us this morning, Lord. We thank you for a chance to look into these wonderful doctrines. Help us, Lord, to, to just see who you are this morning. Help us to uh, worship you in a greater way as we see and learn about you and your majesty and your glory and your mercy, how you've put all these things together in this one, one doctrine, this one chapter, your wrath and mercy and justice and compassion and so, Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, help us to understand these things the way you'd want us to. Help me to present these things the way you'd want me to. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just a quick review from last week. We talked about the five requirements to understand and appreciate God's sovereign election of sinners. And so just I'm going to run through those really quick. First, you need doctrinal integ integrity. So at the beginning of this chapter, Paul's like, I'm telling you guys the truth. My conscience is clear. And the reason Paul has to say that is he's going to say hard things. Peter even says later in one of Peter's epistles that the apostle Paul says things that are hard to understand. I think he's referring to Romans 9. Secondly, you need a heart for the lost. You see Paul's heart for his people Israel who had rejected their Savior Third, you need a basic understanding of Israel. Um, so Paul's going to give a little history of who Israel is and the privileges that Israel has. Um, and it's good for you to know about Israel because they're still a big player in human history. Here we are 2,000 years later and Israel's still in the news pretty much every day. And so it's important to understand God's intention for Israel. Fourth, you need spiritual eyes. Because Paul's going to say things like, not all Israel are Israel. That's like saying not all Americans are Americans. <laughs> uh, not, and, and so you need eyes to see some of these things that Paul's trying to reveal. We're going to get into that more um, next week. And then fifth, you need a humility to accept who God is and who we are. 
because God is acting in, in, his, in who he is. And so God's name, what he told Moses back in Exodus, is I am. I am who I am. He is completely self-existent. He's not hindered. He's not influenced by any. There's no, he has no pressure to act. Like this is so foreign to us. We are so influenced. We have so many pressures. And God is completely self-existent. So Paul knows that Romans 8, that wonderful chapter, is going to bring up a lot of questions about God's sovereignty. And so he spends Romans 9 answering those tough questions. So this is the Q&A with the Apostle Paul. Paul answers these three questions. The first question And the first two questions we dealt with last week, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. But the first question is, has God's word failed? And the idea is, if Israel, God's chosen people, who have the promises, if they've rejected the Messiah, their Messiah, does that mean God's promises failed? Or you could look at it as God made these covenants with Israel And now he's kind of changing directions and going to the Gentiles. So if God did that to Israel, his people, will he do that to us? Will God change directions on us if our hearts grow too cold? Has God's word failed? And it has not. That's a a no. Because... Not all Israel is Israel, and God always has a remnant of his people. So even in Romans 9, I'm just going to read you verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So there's a remnant of true believers within Jewish people. Interesting fact today, um, latest Gallup poll, 65% of Jewish people um, either aren't religious or or are atheist. And so you see just the, the hardness of the heart there. Question two is found in verse 14, and that is if God elects, if God chooses, doesn't that basically make God unjust or unfair? partial, unrighteous. And so the question Paul says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And he says, by no means. And Paul then argues for the freedom, God's freedom in choosing based on his name that we talked about. Verse 18, so then he, God, has mercy on whomever he wills, and he, God, hardens whomever he wills. And that leads us to the next question in verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? In other words, Paul, if if God is sovereign and God chooses... How can he then hold somebody responsible for their actions? If God hardens somebody's heart, how can he hold them responsible for a hard heart? Because we cannot resist his will. What he's going to do, he's going to do. How can God condemn someone who really has no choice? And that's a good question. It's a question probably most of us have asked as we've studied these things. And so Paul, in a very Jewish, uh, Jesus-like way, responds with these two questions, with three questions. So the first question that Paul asks back, and this is a question to put us in our right place or to put us in our right standing before God, Paul says, verse 20, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Like, who do you think you are 
to ask a finite God these questions that you, in your puny little brain. And if you've been a parent of a teenager, you understand this question perfectly well. In their virtuous and valiant attempt to attain personal autonomy and independence while still living under my roof and barely passing their high school classes, all three of my teenage children have questioned my wisdom and my rules, my rationality, my discipline, and my use of my money, to which I have asked all three of them at different times, who do you think you are? What have you done that makes you think you can approach me that way? Not Alice, not you, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll say something like, hey, maybe after you've earned a college degree or a master's degree or bought a house or bought a car or paid insurance or paid phone bills, or maybe when you've bought your own toilet paper, then you could ask me some of these questions. But what we're basically doing is we're saying, you won't understand some of my decisions until you're in my shoes, until you are under the pressure that I'm under, that, you're, that, you're, that you've experienced some of the things that I've seen and experienced. Right? I, I have reasons for doing what I do that you won't understand until maybe 10 years from now. One of my sons, my most curious son, I won't say his name, but his initials are J.W. He's asked me all, he asked me all kinds of questions. And there's some questions that I say, John, I'm not going to answer that question. Well, I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) He's not even here to defend himself, the poor, the poor lad. But John, um, I'm not going to answer that question until I'm 80 years old. If I make it to 80, I'll answer that question. And he keeps asking me, Dad, tell me, what? Da, da, da. I'm not going to tell you until I'm 80, okay? Quit asking. But God's ways are higher than our ways. Mark Twain once quipped at the age of 21. He said, when I was 17, my dad was an idiot. But it was amazing how much he learned in four years. It's a really good quote. In Romans 11, I want to show you just kind of a little spoiler alert here where Paul's going to end this this whole argument and what he's talking about. Oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. The second question that Paul asks in response here is, why have you made me like this? In verse uh, 20 there. Why have you made me... Well, Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? And I think at the core, this, this is at the heart of the transgender confusion, okay? God, why have you made me like this? God, if I'm a boy, but I have these emotions and feelings and I, I kind of relate more to the girls, Why have you made me a boy? And I want to, I want to say to that person, you're going to be, you're going to be a great husband one day. You're going to be a great dad because you have these emotions and these feelings that I wish I had. And I, and, and there's, and I need men like you to help me understand how to have these emotions. But if you just turn into a girl, it's not helping any. See? And it goes both ways with the girl's side of things, too. Everything God's made is very good. God doesn't make mistakes. (laughs) 
And, and the doctors and the psychologists and the educators and the lawmakers who encourage such rebellion against God, our Creator, they're going to be held accountable for this. And you will, on that day of judgment, need God's mercy. Because you're mutilating God's creation. It's really bad. What's going on? So verse 21. Sorry, I just kind of... When I read that, I'm like, okay. (laughs) Here's the question. Verse 21, though. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? So... Does the potter have the right out of the same lump to make some for honorable use? Some, some things in our households are honorable, like dishes and cups and serving plates. But there's some things that we use out of that same clay that are dishonorable, like trash cans and sinks and toilets. I want to show you, though, what Paul says. This is interesting, out of the same kind of metaphor and, and uh, I think it's 2 Timothy, yeah, 2.20. In a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. In other words, we all kind of start as dishonorable because of our sin, because we're in Adam, because of our rebellion to God. But if we repent of these dishonorable things, we can be of honorable use, useful to the master for every good work. But underline that same lump. Can you make out of the same lump vessels for honor and dishonor? We're all from that same lump. We're all sinners. One of the things that one quote I heard this week that I'm really thinking about is we don't, we don't live by logic as Christians. We live by faith. And I think that's important to realize as we go through this life. We don't live by logic. We live by faith. And so Paul's going to ask maybe the most important question in verse 22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. So Paul's going to take us to the, this, this question takes us right over the precipice. Like we're going to look pretty deep into this. And Paul, it doesn't seem like he's confident here because he asks a hypothetical question. What if God did this? I'm going to extrapolate this doctrine, but in Paul's mind, I don't know if this is exactly how it goes, but what if he did? To show us who he is, verse 22. So a couple things you need to see in this. What if God desiring to show? So God desires to show his wrath and to make his power known. And he's endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Right? He is a God of justice. He is a God of wrath. He is a God of power. Most of you in here, I'd say probably 95% of you in here, have heard about God parting the sea so that the Israelites could go through. And then he judged the Egyptians. And most of you have seen that maybe because you watched a Disney movie or whatever. But if God didn't harden Pharaoh's heart, you wouldn't know about God opening up the sea for the people to go through, to display his power. And so God has a purpose in these things. Um, You read the end of Revelation. I don't even want to read it this morning, but you read the end of Revelation. You want to see the power of God and judgment. It'll, It'll scare your socks off, yeah. But I want you to see something in verse 22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Okay? 
in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand. So notice there, there are two different words actually in the Greek. And one is just, they're prepared for destruction. The other one is, he has, God has prepared beforehand for glory. Do you see the difference? Again, we're right on the, the edge. <laughs> Apart from Christ, we're all fitted for destruction. Because in our sin, we're all under the wrath of God. That's Romans 1 through 3. We all have the orange jumpsuit on. We're all shackled before the judge in our sin. But verse 23, for the purpose to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand. So God allowed sin to come into the world to demonstrate his power and justice and mercy, but God is not the author of sin. He didn't create sin. James 1.13 actually says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. And then he says, Everything good comes from above. What I want to leave you with, what I want you to see is that God's, God reveals this to you if you're a Christian to see his mercy displayed in your life. That's what you need to walk away with. That God has given and shown me great mercy and great compassion. When I read verses 22 and 23 as a new Christian. And when I was at seminary, I, was at, I only was a Christian for two years when I went to seminary. And so I would hear guys having all these debates <laughs> about this stuff and at the college, this Christian college. But all I locked on to was in order, verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. And when I, was, when, I, when I gave my um, senior testimony in seminary, I said, I don't know, guys, what all these verses mean. <laughs> Some of you guys are smarter and you can figure this out, but all I know is <laughs> I'm a vessel of mercy. That somehow God and his grace would choose me to show his mercy to the world. That in spite of my sin, in spite of the stupid things I've done, screw-ups I've done, God would choose me to be a vessel for mercy. And if you're a Christian, if God has chosen you and you are saved and you've repented, it's because God has chose you to show his mercy and his compassion to the world. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a chance to preach on Romans 9. Thank you for these glorious truths, Lord. I pray that you would um, continue to help us understand these things in the days to come. Thank you for your mercy in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.